Hello, everyone. Dr. Tim here with Hillary, our social coordinator, coordinator and uh, for another podcast, What's in the Mailbox? Questions? You have questions? We're going to give you the answers. How are you doing today, Hillary? I'm doing good. How about you? Good, good. It's Wednesday, hump day, right? Yeah. It's not Monday. It's not Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, not Monday. Not Monday. So we have a list of questions that we've gotten either through the info email, um, through Facebook, Instagram, and these are just some questions that we, you know, just go ahead and address. And I'll say at the beginning of this, if you guys are listening and you have questions, feel free to send them. We try and answer them as we get them, but some like these figure it'd be a good idea to share them in case other people have the same questions. Um, you can send us an email, info at uh, drtimsquatics.com. Um, we answer those or reach out on any of the social media platforms and we'll get to those there. So first up, um, I'm running GFO in a reactor. Once I start using the gels, those waste away gels, should I stop running the GFO reactor? So the answer to that is it depends on what your GFO is, it, it, or it depends on what your phosphate is, sorry. So the granular ferric oxide, GFO, removes phosphate, but it doesn't remove nitrate. The problem can be that if you remove all the phosphate from the water, or basically down to where it's unmeasurable, the bacteria that are released by the gel can't divide. They need a little bit of phosphate in the water to divide and remove the nitrate. So if your phosphate is low, say below uh, one, I would say remove or the GFO from the system and let the bacteria do their thing. Because if you're trying to remove or reduce nitrate specifically, and you don't have any phosphate in the water or you have very low phosphate in the water, the bacteria can't do the job. They can't multiply and assimilate that nitrate into more bacteria cells. So below one, remove the GFO. And so just so I'm clear, um, what's happening when you do our gels, because this is another question that people are unclear about, is you're releasing gels or releasing bacteria from the gels into the water 24-7. Those bacteria grow and as, or multiply, as they multiply, they're removing the nitrate and phosphate from the water. Because we had a question from one of our um, distributor salespeople in Japan about, well, I thought you could only remove nitrate versus by, by denitrification. And that's, that's one way. You can remove nitrate by denitrification, converting it to dinitrogen or nitrogen gas. But the gels remove both nitrate and phosphate by converting them into bacteria cells. For the bacteria to grow, they remove nitrate and phosphate from the water, producing more bacteria cells. And that's where the skimmer comes in the skimmer then removes the bacteria from the water, thereby removing the nitrate and the phosphate. If you don't have any phosphate in the water, that process will stop. So. All right, good to know. All about balance. Yep. <laughs> okay, so I've got another question and this one is also about gels. Um, so somebody wrote to us and said that they purchased one of the gels that treats a hundred gallons and they used it on um, a 45 gallon tank. They went away for a while 
And when they came back, they saw a bunch of slimy, fuzzy stuff, and they had, unfortunately, some dead fish. Why did this happen? Well, as we say on the packaging, we don't want you to use a larger gel in a smaller tank because the, we are time releasing a certain amount of bacteria into the water. And we're making a few assumptions about how much waste is in the tank because that's what the bacteria are feeding on. If you take a big gel, a gel for a 100 gallon tank and put it in a 40 gallon tank, you're basically releasing two and a half times more bacteria per gallon than what we're suggesting. And where you can get in trouble is that if you have a system that has a lot of organics and a lot of nitrate and phosphate, the bacteria can multiply and they can have, you can have a bacterial bloom oh. where they're multiplying so fast because there's so much food you need to remove them. That's why you have to have the skimmer on and be paying attention. And that's also why we make the recommendation that before you use the gels, you should use the liquid waste away to clean up the tank first, get it back in balance because the liquid waste away, you add just a very little in initially and you're going in and the, or the bacteria are going in the crevices under the rock work in every place that you can't see the nooks and crannies, as we say, and degrading all the organic material in there. So basically you've overdosed your tank by using too big of a gel in a smaller tank. Well, that, that's unfortunate. It's, you know, you talk about using the liquid first to do, like, I like to call it like the spring cleaning, do that real big deep clean that you do every now and then. I think that's a good. Right. And what we say with the liquids is, is start, you can always add more. So just start with a small amount, a quarter dose, a fifth of the dose, just to see how your tank's going to react, especially the first time when you've never used it, because there are real bacteria in there and they grow and how fast they grow is dependent upon how much food and the food is organics, phosphates and nitrates. And if you have a lot, they're going to grow like crazy and you've got to have a balance there and a way of removing them, which is also why we recommend don't adding them at night and just not paying attention to the tank. When first using these products, you should, use them when you're going to be there and you can see the reaction. If the tank water starts to go hazy, you know, that's a bloom and you mm -hmm. can control that by turning the skimmer on by uh, adding aeration or things like that. Now I have another question that's kind of sparked while we're talking about things is, so if, if you were on vacation, a lot of, not necessarily saltwater tanks, but freshwater tanks, they still have like those little vacation feeder like cubes that you put in the tank could right. that also like if they have a constant source of food that's in there all of the time that probably too could contribute i'm guessing oh yeah that's that's the problem auto feeders on you know craziness because if the fish don't eat it then the food's just piling up mm -hmm. and uh the food piles up and the bacteria degrade that. Now you're adding more bacteria and they degrade that even faster. So it's, it's again, it's a balance in the problem with the, the auto feeders is they, they can definitely get stuck and overfeed the tank. All right, now the last part of this one, and I think we've talked about this in some of our other podcasts is like the slimy fuzzy stuff coming off of those gels. If you guys are using the gels and you see that, it's not a bad thing. Like if you look on the back of the packaging, we even have that on there. That's something that you can actually expect to see. Right. We've got some pictures on the website, but that little or that that clearer kind of gel that forms that slime is the bacteria forming a, a biofilm. And 
if you have a freshwater shrimp tank, that's food. You'll, you'll see the shrimp all over it. So don't freak out. They're not eating the gel. They're eating the bacteria biofilm because the bacteria are food for other organisms. And those other organisms are then food for the shrimp. And if, and if you have a reef tank, that slime, you can just wipe it off and let it go into the water and the corals will, you know, that'll land on a coral oral disc and the corals will eat that. That's all food. All that bacterial biofilm or slime is food for other organisms. Good to know. All right. Next up, and this kind of is along the same lines of, I want to say overdosing, but our our question is, I have a 75 gallon tank with a 31 gallon sump. The size bottle I purchased was a large one, which covers twice as much as I need. Should I use more than I need or save the extra for future use? Now it doesn't specify which product they had. I was but... going to say what product. <laughs> if, if it's one and only, you should use a, uh, the whole bottle. There's no reason to save it. One dose, put it in there. You can't overdose it. The nitrifying bacteria cannot grow fast enough. Uh, they, don't, they don't multiply every 20 minutes like the heterotrophic bacteria that are in equal balance, waste away, clear up and refresh. So one and only, put it all in. The rest of the bacteria, as I just said, if it's the first time using it, don't even use the normal dose. As we say in bold, underline, it would be a flashing sign if we could. Start <laughs> with a low dose, a quarter dose of the normal amount that we recommend uh, just because we don't know how your tank's going to react. And you can then dose a little bit more tomorrow and you know, just slowly yep. build up. Just be patient. Yep, exactly. Rather have not enough than too much. I can always add more. Yep. Okay. And, and now when we, let me, let me, before, don't, don't add more 15 minutes later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's give let's be a little clear. Yeah. Give it 24 hours. Let's put a condition there. Add some 24 hours later, nothing's happened. Add a little bit more. You're building up the bacteria in, in the system, not 15 minutes. Like people, uh, add one and only to a tank full of ammonia. And then 15 minutes later, I measured my ammonia 15 minutes later. What's well, going to take a little bit more than 15 minutes for the bacteria to get rid of all that ammonia. You got to give this a, a little bit of time, folks. We usually talk in intervals of 24 hours. Yep. <laughs> all right. Now this next one is one that I feel like we see on a fairly regular basis, but we're going to go ahead and address it again. I am X number of days into the cycle, I'm still not seeing any nitrite. What's going on? What's going on is the product is working. <laughs> yeah, that's so we're kind of conditioned because you read everywhere, well, you're going to have ammonia, you're going to have nitrite. But with our one and only, we try to mix heavily in terms of a ratio of ammonia oxidizers to nitrite oxidizers to add more nitrite oxidizers in the mix because they work slower, which means if it was a 50-50 mix, the ammonia guys who work faster will process all the ammonia and the nitrite would build up. And, and, and nitrite will build up a little bit, but we don't want it to build up too much where it stalls the cycle. And in many cases, you won't see any nitrite because they're processing the ammonia that's being produced as soon as it's being produced, which means the product is working. So you know you're adding ammonia. If you don't see nitrite, don't freak out because it's being processed. And then you might say, well, I don't see any nitrate either. Well, the, pro the issue there is very few test kits that are available to hobbyists, especially the just the liquid color metric ones where you add a couple of reagents and shake it up. Very few of those measure nitrate very well when the nitrate level is below 20. Mm -hmm. So when you're just starting out and you're adding 
you know, two parts per, per million ammonia once or twice, the nitrate's only going to be four, five, six, way below that level of 20. And these kits won't pick it up unless you shake for 20, 30 minutes till your arm's ready to fall off after you've added that first reagent, which is reducing the nitrate to nitrite and then measuring the nitrite. That's how these test kits work, as I've said many times. You're just not going to get a reading. So don't freak out where I don't have nitrite. I don't have nitrate. This whole thing's working. What's wrong? No, it is working. It's just that the limitations of the test kit are that you can't measure that le that low level of nitrate right away. Awesome. Now, something also along with this, and I know you've mentioned it, you have a blog, right? If somebody, yep. and I think this is one of the things that's addressed on the blog, if you wanted to go look and read some of the blog articles that are on there, where would one go to find that? Well, the, the blog is at... Um, drtimsaquatics.com. Right. Yeah, and then up there you'll see blog. And uh, I don't post every day, but I do try to post weekly. <laughs> try. And if you're listening to this and you would like the direct link, feel free to message us. We can always send you links to the website or to any of these products if you're interested. Yep. And if you have an idea or have a question, you would like some more details, um, suggest a topic, uh, yes. always interested in, you know, we have different levels. We try to keep this interest, well, interesting and easy to understand. But if you really want to get into nitrifying bacteria and the things like that, we can do that too. Yeah. This is an excellent resource. Take advantage of it. <laughs> okay. Next up. Can I use your ammonia with another brand's bacteria that I already have? Will the cycle be any different? Well, it'll be different because those other brands don't work as good as one and only, but ammonia is ammonia. So you, you can use it with other bacteria, but don't expect the same results using other companies because the unfortunate fact is some companies don't have nitrifying bacteria in their mix. Um, so you're, you're not going to have as good a result using other bacteria. Yeah. So it may vary from product to product. Obviously, we're not familiar with necessarily all of them. So we yes, recommend we that you use one and only with our ammonia. Yes. We know that works. Yeah. All right. Next up. Can I use one and only, or can I add one and only into a quarantine tank that already has fish in it? Yes, one and only nitrifying bacteria are completely non-toxic. There's nothing in there but nitrifying bacteria, and they do not harm any of the organisms, uh, fish or corals. So you can add it at any time. Um, now, don't yeah it. It takes time for the bacteria to get rid of the ammonia and the nitrite. So if you're in a quarantine or even setting up your tank and you've been dosing or adding that cut shrimp and the tank is cloudy and full of ammonia, you know, it's off the chart. Don't expect the bacteria to bring that down to zero in 24 hours. It's a numbers game. The bacteria can only process so much ammonia the ammonia is really high. You're adding a small bottle. It's going to take a couple of days. If you're super, if you're in a super, super hurry, you've just got to get that ammonia down. It's really better to do a water change and then add the one and only into the system. You know, even your quarantine tank, your, you know, if you do water change, your fish can still be in the tank, add fresh seawater or if it's freshwater system, fresh water, and then add the bacteria then. All right. Makes sense. Yeah, quarantine tanks, I feel like, are tricky. I don't know. I, I'd love to do a poll. Maybe I should do a poll on our stories and see who is consistently running a quarantine tank just as one of the tanks that they have on hand versus 
do you set up a quarantine tank when you know you're getting new fish or try and set one up as you have a sick fish? I think it's be interesting to yeah, I I pretty that. much always run a quarantine tank, but then I have you know, pall pallets of ammonia. But you don't need pallet. You can just have a little bit of the you know the bottle of ammonia and just feed it once in a while. You don't the bacteria don't have to be fed every day. No, uh, and, and that's I will go off a little tangent because when cycling, people will say, "Well, the ammonia zero, the nitrites a little high." You know, should I add more ammonia because the bacteria are going to starve? The bacteria are not going to starve. They, they're not human. They can go a long time without ammonia. So as we say in our directions, if your nitrite is high, don't add the ammonia that day or even for two or three days while cycling, let the nitrite drop and then start adding, uh, re-adding the ammonia in the system. But you don't have to add it every day. In a quarantine tank, keep it running and then add ammonia uh, every, every three days, every four days, just a few drops, vary it. Some days add, you know, two drops a gallon, some days add one or a half, just like there's different amounts of ammonia being added by fish. The bacteria will be uh, fine, they'll be active and ready should you have to take a fish out of uh, your main tank, you know, assuming you can catch it because it's much easier to treat a fish in a hospital tank than in your community tank. Yes, 100%. <laughs> yeah. It can be hard. You have to maybe tear apart everything, but if, uh, you know, sometimes that's the only choice you have depending on the fish, especially if you're not sure what it is and, and it can wipe out your entire system, you've got to get it out of there. Exactly. I was just having a conversation with somebody about this the other day and getting out, got a sick fish, go ahead and get it out. It's easier to treat and quarantine. Well, and cheaper. Your, your hospital tank, you know, is 10 gallons, maybe 20 gallons at the most versus your display tank, which can be quite large. And uh, it's just much easier, easier to do water changes the, the high concentration bass, which are a great way, mm -hmm. you know, if, if the fish is sick and you know, it's sick and you've got to treat it now, you can hit it hard with the medication in the hospital tank and just do what is basically a dip, which is a very high concentration where you're only leaving the fish in there 20 minutes, 30 minutes. It just depends. And then you remove the, the medication, do a big water change, but, You've, by hitting it with a really high, high dose for a short period of time, you kill, <coughs> excuse me, you kill whatever the disease is. That's the most effective way if the fish, you know the fish is disease, is to hit it with a powerful dip. Yes. yes. I'm all about, especially freshwater dips. Mm, love those. Yeah. Stressful, stressful for me and probably the fish more so, but very successful. Yeah. So now but those who don't know, so typically with saltwater fish and the d bacteria and uh, even the uh, protozoan diseases, the, the different types of uh, diseases that saltwater fish get, if you take the fish and dip it in fresh water, the osmotic difference, the fresh water being fresh versus salt, will basically cause the cell to explode. The fish can tolerate it. I mean, it depends, but you, you can't just leave it. You got to be observing the fish. You should have the temperature close. But putting the fish in that fresh water dip for a, a certain amount of time, again, it depends on the fish, can cause those organisms to, ex to basically explode and die. And the fish will be fine for a few minutes in that freshwater dip. And yeah. then you can move it back to salt water and let it recover. It's, it's stressful, but it's just like with, when humans are sick. Sometimes the medications they give you when you're sick are pretty stressful to you too, but that's what you've, you know, has to happen. Yeah. Nobody, I don't think, I haven't met anybody that enjoys getting shots, but <laughs> shots going to be annoying and painful for a minute or so yeah you feel better 
Okay, so our next two questions both deal with EcoBalance. The first one is how often should I dose EcoBalance? Every day, every week, a couple times a month? Well, there's really none of our products. There's no product in the, in the market from anybody that you need to be dosing every day. If you've got to dose every day, something something's wrong, okay? Uh, your system should be stable. The only thing you should add every day is some fish food maybe. Um, and even then fish don't have to eat every day. So eco balance, it really depends upon the fish load, but I would say every two weeks would be a good uh, time. If it's a lighter fish load, maybe every three weeks. But uh, what you're adding is, is these probiotic bacteria to bind to different binding sites in the system. And also they extrude these bacteria sins that can kill uh, the pathogenic bacteria that, that are in the system. But um, every two weeks should be fine. All right, good to know. And the last question that I've got for you today is can I dose EcoBalance at the same time that I dose Vibrant? Ooh, I'm gonna say no. <laughs> Uh, for well now full disclosure never used vibrant but i don't think it's good to dose any two medications at the same time um you can have these these uh, different effects usually negative um so i would say never dose two medications or, or two products bacterial based products at the same time we say that, uh, and I've got a, a blog post on that of what you can use with what, and like waste away, eco balance, clear up, should always be dosed by themselves. At least you know wait at least twenty four hours, forty eight hours before dosing another bacterial based product, and also like first defense. Or in, in first defense is a bunch of vitamins. You've got products that have sugars, not, not Dr. Tim's products, but other products that have sugars and amino acids. Well, those are all food for bacteria. And that's why we say right on the bottle, don't use first defense or these other types of fuels when dosing the waste away or any bacteria product, you know, one and only is fine but the heterotrophic bacteria, because you're basically adding too, or potentially adding too much food to the system, which can cause the bacterial bloom that we talked about earlier when we first started the podcast. Exactly. Yeah. All right. And that's why, you know, people uh, will clean their tanks, stir up everything. When you stir up, the substrate in your tank, chances are really good you're releasing phosphate into the water. And phosphate is, in almost all cases, the critical substance. The system doesn't have a lot of phosphate. And that's what everybody, when I say everybody, the algae, the bacteria, all these microorganisms in the, in the tank want phosphate. It gets, it gets locked up in your substrate. You're cleaning it and it releases it. And that's why a little while later after cleaning your tank, you may notice, you know, the water was kind of cloudy, but it wasn't like this. Now it's really hazy. Well, that's because you've released phosphate by stirring up the sediment as you gravel washed or whatever you moved decorations or whatever you did. And now the bacteria are multiplying due to the release of that phosphate from the sediments. Well, if you go and add a, a few, you know, a, a few, a few of what I call these sugars, these amino acids, you're adding even more food for the bacteria. After so, after you clean the tank, the, the tank can actually look worse due to the bacterial blooms. So be careful about adding additives right after cleaning your tank. You can wait 24 hours and let, let the mechanical filter, whatever it is, the sponge, the filter pad, filter out this material and things settle down a little bit. It's, uh, 
quite common in the fall when people have been out all summer, they look at their tank and they, you know, kind of get this religion. I'm going to really clean the tank today. And that can add, that can be in a lot, end up in disasters many times because you change the filters, you stir up the gravel, you wash down the sides, you really upset the system and release all these nutrients that have been locked up because you haven't done maintenance in a couple of months. So yeah. always best to take things slow, is it, slow and in measured steps in your aquarium. Yes. Yep. I like that. Even in my tanks, I know about how much I can dose, but I still like, I do half doses. <laughs> yeah. And again, cause we always get this, uh, when you're first setting up your tank, yes, run your filter and the components of the filter, the filter pad, the sponge, the blue fuzzy pad, what we say is to remove the micron, the, the filter bag, which is a, you know measured in micron. So if you're not sure what a filter bag is, I've got a blog post on that on drtimsaquatics.com with some pictures and you can see what we mean. We don't mean the blue fuzzy pad, the sponge or floss. We're talking about a very specific object, the filter bag that basically removes things in the two and 400 micron size. And the reason that's critical to remove is we've grown the bacteria, the one and only bacteria on a substrate, because that's where these guys want to be. The filter bag will trap that, mic that uh, nanoparticle with the bacteria on it. And then it'll trap it there and it won't be in the tank where we want it. So just the filter socks, not the filter pad material get the filters running and your heaters you know I'm, I'm wondering and i don't know because i haven't personally used one of these the um the rolling filters i wonder what size those are if that could be put in the same category as filter socks i would say that's probably in the same category as the filter socks yeah i, I would not run your water through those when you're first setting up and dosing the one and only I, I guess they are getting more and more popular. Yeah. I always think they look so cool not to, not to be able to have to mess with changing filter socks. Oh, man, that'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. But not yet. All right. Well, those are all the, oh, wait, I've got one more question. Last minute that just came in on Instagram. Um, <laughs> if somebody is using- Are they listening to us? <laughs> <laughs> It's funny, I've got my phone here and I'm kind of like, you know, I get the notifications. So mm -hmm. I, I see when these pop up. But if somebody wants to use first defense and they've got a reef tank, is it reef safe? Are they good to just go ahead and use it in a reef? Yes, it's, first defense is reef safe. What can happen is with these skimmers that are like wash tubs in Niagara Falls is you can, it can cause some foaming because there are vitamins in there and the vitamins can foam. So you might, again, want to start off with a half a dose of the first defense, but it is hundred percent reef safe. There's nothing in there, but vitamins and it's not going to harm your, harm your tank. All right. Now that was my last question. <laughs> All right. So keep the questions coming folks. We definitely appreciate it. And we, we learn a lot. We like of talking with hobbyists as we can and uh, appreciate you listening. And this has been Dr. Tim and Hillary, Dr. Tim's Aquatics. And thank you very much.